Hey, deserving listeners, let's answer patron emails. This first email is from anonymous patron. He writes, on a recent episode of the podcast, you talked about the problem of therapists treating problems that they are not qualified to treat. I am a student therapist currently completing my internship, and I couldn't agree more. However, during my internship, I am providing free therapy to all my clients, and as a result, I have many clients who can barely pay rent each month, let alone a therapist. The government here provides some free therapy to those in need, but the waiting lists are very long. Even for someone who had just experienced a major crisis, the wait list can be over five months. For these individuals, student therapists like me are often the only place they have to turn. I don't feel it would be ethical for me to turn clients away due to not having the training to properly handle their issues because I have because they have no one else that they can turn to. I'm frank and honest with them about my student status and my lack of experience with their issues, and I tell them that at the very least I can listen and try to accompany them on their difficult journey. I have a good supervisor who is helping me with, with all this, but I was hoping to hear some encouragement or words of wisdom about the situation. Do you think it's okay for me to offer therapy to clients with serious issues that I don't have training for? End of email. Yeah, so bottom line, we definitely want to only treat clients that we are competent to work with. And there's a big problem in my field of therapists not knowing what they're competent in or not knowing what clients they need to assess that might have issues that aren't within their competency range, this kind of thing. At the same time, you bring up a good point that if someone comes to you that you have and, and th that client has issues that you're not competent with, but there's no one else that they can talk to, then maybe it's better that they have at least you to talk to about that. Now, there are some examples of some disorders. I won't go into the weeds on it, but you would talk with your supervisor and maybe other people about this that you would actually be at risk of harming them even though you're quote unquote just listening and accompanying them on their d difficult journey. PTSD comes to mind, psychosis comes to mind, drug addiction might come to mind. There's things that even though no one is available to talk to them and you're the only one who could maybe just listen, even though your heart's in the right place, you might actually harm them. And so you wanna screen them out. You don't wanna just say, well, you know, these people, they don't have anyone else to talk to, and therefore I'm better than them going to no one. That's not actually guaranteed. You might actually be not better than them going to no one. They might be better off not talking to anyone until they can talk to a specialist. Having said that, sure, absolutely. If uh, you screen out those at-risk people, and you're there and you're confused and you're just like, ah, I'm, I'm in way over my head, but I'm listening, I'm validating, I'm, I'm helping them maybe with some, some issues. Yeah, certainly that can help. But again, I would talk with your supervisor about screening out certain kinds of clients. And this really points to a larger issue that in my society and other societies, we don't have enough tax dollars being al allocated to these sorts of things. And it's a shame. It's oppression. It is essentially the government and the people and the politicians and the voters ignoring the needs of an oppressed class of people, people who need therapy. And so we need to vote. We need to pressure politicians to allocate more money. Imagine a world in which everyone had a therapist that they can talk to within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, maybe in a crisis, they can talk to someone within a few days. Maybe if it's not a crisis, they get a therapist that they need, some you know, a good therapist within, say, two or three months. And it is a therapist that it specializes in their area and pays for weekly therapy for as long as they need to in order to help them. Imagine a world like that. Now, in Seattle, some people live like that. Some people have health insurance that is that. But most people don't have that. Most people in the United States actually have health insurance that doesn't have that level of benefit, or they have no insurance at all, or they live in a community that doesn't have therapists, particularly on the, around the world. And it's an awful thing. It is just a, it's a neglect, it's an oppress, it's an oppressive part of our uh, societies. We're biased against people like this. We think they're weak. Of course, as you know, we all need therapy, and some people really need therapy and deserve it. Anyway, let's go into another email. All right, this next email is from Anonymous Patron. They write, 
I was recently diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. As you can probably imagine, this is rather concerning to me. For a while now, I've been in school with the intention of becoming a clinical psychologist. This is because I appreciate the study and I find it fascinating to learn about other people's minds. However, receiving this diagnosis has forced me to question my ability to get into this field, this being due to the gatekeeping you have talked about in previous podcast episodes. Do you think that someone with my diagnosis can successfully operate as a clinical psychologist? Are mental health background checks performed on students who wish to become licensed? End of email. So I'll answer the last question first because it's pretty easy. No. Uh, Generally speaking, depending on the field, I mean, there's some military circles where you will have this. You're not going to have a mental health background check, meaning that Uh, If you apply for a job at an agency, they're not going to perform a whole battery of personality tests to determine if you have some diagnosis that's going to interfere with your ability to be a therapist. That doesn't happen, at least in my community, it doesn't happen. And it might even be discriminatory. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, so that's that question. But then the other question you have is, you know, do you think that someone with antisocial personality disorder can successfully operate as a clinical psychologist? And the answer is absolutely, but it depends. It depends on what kind of flavor you have. It depends on the job that you have. It depends on your overall personality. I mean, being diagnosed with antisocial doesn't encompass your whole personality, of course. People with antisocial personality disorder are you know, very different individuals, and so it really just depends. So things to consider are, uh, why are you being diagnosed with this? You know, that uh, it's more important that you understand why you're being diagnosed as opposed to just the label itself, because it could mean a lot of different things. There's a possibility that you're diagnosed with this because of behavior, but not necessarily with your lack of empathy or your lack of caring of other human beings. It's also possible that you were diagnosed with it because you actually don't have capacity for empathy and you don't actually care about other people. You say that you want to study clinical psychology because you appreciate psychology and you find it fascinating to learn about other people's minds. Well, I'm that way too, but I also deeply care about other human beings. Now, that's the question you wanna ask yourself. Do you deeply care about other human beings? And if you do, then either you don't have any social personality disorder or you have a flavor of it that should be explained to you by whoever is diagnosing you with it. Uh, But if you don't have feelings for other people, you might want to think about a job in psychology that doesn't involve helping other human beings. There are many people in clinical or in um, uh, research psychology that never work with people clinically. And so that would absolutely be in line with learning about other people's minds. Or as a psychologist, you could become an assessor, someone who doesn't actually treat people uh, through a therapeutic relationship, but actually writes up psychological assessments. So there's a lot of options, and I would find a mentor and someone that you could really trust with this information and really think about it. Uh, very, very uh, in-depth because there's a lot of potential problems. For example, there's a scenario, and I don't know you, but there's a scenario with a therapist who was uh, you know, actually legitimately diagnosed with antisocial or psychopathy, and they would harm their clients po- probably more often than someone that wasn't diagnosed with that because They have a hard time developing caring, compassionate, deep, empathetic relationships, and the client feels that, and it can feel bad to the client. So it's something you definitely want to think about, but it doesn't mean that you have no place in the field. But again, I would find out why you're being diagnosed with that. (laughs) You, You need a long, understandable explanation as to why someone sees that in you. All right, this next email is from Anonymous Patron. She writes, I'm a young college student from Texas, and for most of my life, I've been surrounded by small-town mindsets. I'm constantly stuck between 
wanting to go with what everyone else thinks and just dealing with the cognitive dissonance or thinking and expressing my own more open-minded beliefs and feeling sort of shame or guilt for them being different from the others around me, what should I do? End of email. Well, I don't know. You know, it's a tough situation. I would love to think that you'd be able to express yourself, even though it's different from the beliefs around you, particularly if they're more open-minded between you and me. But, you know, it's easier said than done. The thing that I have been saying lately is what's the goal? Think about what your overall goal is and then think about whether or not it's realistic. Of course, it'd be great if you could change everyone's mind or you could express your thoughts and everyone would respect you. But we all know that's not going to happen or it's not likely to happen. So what's your goal? Is your goal to stand up for yourself? Then you're going to have to deal with the consequences of other people not liking what you're saying or ostracizing you or arguing with you or something. But if it's worth working on the goal of standing up for yourself, then it's worth it to you. Or maybe the goal is to change other people's minds. Well, there's some you know realism check you're going to have to do there. But if that's your goal, then you sit down and you try to convince and you do all the things and it's a campaign you go on and you realize it's not going to it's not going to happen overnight or is the goal to survive and then that changes what you do right and maybe you have a bunch of goals but that's the key an honest patron is what do you want to get out of this situation do you want to change their mind do you want to survive do you want to tell them off do you want to stand up for yourself Do you want to change just one person's mind, but the other people you don't care about? Do you want to move away? (laughs) You know, do you want to represent uh, your side of the story? Do you want to raise questions? What's your goal? But every goal that you have and every choice that you make, there's there's going to be pros and there's going to be cons, and you just have to make a cost-benefit analysis for that. Having said that, if everyone... Uh, sort of pass the buck, then we would still have slaves in this country. And we still wouldn't have women voting in this country. And we wouldn't have civil rights in the United States. So sometimes we have to um, swallow the pill and do what needs to be done in order to move this country towards social justice. So I don't know the situation you're in, but that's just another part of the puzzle. It's sort of like uh, if you see litter on the side of the road, if everyone just walks by it because it's too much of a pain in the butt, then we have a bunch of litter just piling up in the road. Or if we have a bunch of plastic building up in the Pacific Ocean, if every country just says, well, you know, we have other, th- we have other goals that we're working on, then the Pacific Ocean is just going to be one giant floating plastic thing. So sometimes justice and the right thing needs to be done. And I'm not saying that's what you're supposed to do because, you know, it sounds like you're in a tough spot. But that is something we all have to think about and all have to work into our decision making. All right. Next email is from anonymous listener. She writes, I just had a session with my art therapist. And during our conversation, the therapist said, and that's why you are so fucked up. I couldn't believe my ears. I felt, I felt very awkward. I didn't know what to say, and I started laughing. The therapist and me, we were laughing for some time. To me, it wasn't, it wasn't funny what the therapist said, rather funny that the therapist said it at all. I ended up asking, did you mean what you said? And the therapist answered, it slipped, and then later added, it applies to me too, meaning that she was saying she was fucked up too. But I felt offended. Do you have any thoughts or comments? End of email. Well, it, it's not on its face a, an automatic ethical violation or clinical problem to try to level with your client or to try to make a joke or to, I don't know. I, I'd have to talk with a therapist. It, it certainly isn't an, a, a very common thing for a therapist to say. I'll say that. But I'd have to hear what they said. And certainly in the thousands of sessions I've had over the years, I might have said something similar given uh, that I thought it might be a good idea to joke around about that. I don't know. 
And certainly the broader topic of can therapists sometimes joke around and maybe take a little too far with their clients? Yeah, that, that can certainly happen. But the bottom line is for you, anonymous listener, is that you felt hurt and you uh, and it threatens your relationship with your therapist and you should bring that up and you should ask your therapist what was going on and you should ask for an apology and you should uh, find out if you can actually trust your therapist by giving them a chance to, uh, to apologize. If I had overstepped a boundary or if I had let something slip or something, as the therapist said, what a wonderful opportunity I'm given to apologize for that and to make up for it and to provide a corrective experience where I actually take responsibility and apologize. So, of course, you want to bring that up with your therapist. This next email is from patron Janet from Michigan. She says, you've touched on how culture and psychology are intertwined. I read a book called Crazy Like Us, The Globalization of the American Psyche by Ethan Waters that made me think about this. I've been living as an expat in Vietnam for a few years and have been hearing about more initiatives to bring Western mental health services to Saigon uh, to, in Vietnam for local people. I feel a bit skeptical about this, though, and I'm unsure if it's well-intentioned, even though I'm sure it's well-intentioned. Do you think cross-cultural therapy is ever useful and or ethical? End of email. Yeah, it's a complicated thing, and I don't know the particulars regarding this initiative to bring Western mental health services to Saigon, but I imagine that, that there's a few things happening here. One is, is that in a lot of areas around the world, they don't have clinicians to help and they don't even have an infrastructure to educate people. And so what happens a lot of times is they either will send people from that community to a Western country like the United States to get trained and then they go back or they bring educators from that country or they just bring clinicians from that country. Essentially, what they're trying to do is accelerate the mental health uh, provision to the citizens uh, instead of waiting for a culture and a education system and hundreds and thousands of clinicians to spring up out of nowhere, uh, they just accelerate the, pro the process by bringing in people from areas where there's a lot of therapists, a lot of clinicians, i.e. the Western world or United States. So uh, on one hand, it might be an overall good. But on the other hand, as you bring it up, there's a lot of potential problems here. One is, is that, which is obvious, is can someone say from Seattle, a white person from Seattle, can they understand the person in Saigon well enough to help them and to not harm them? Uh, that's a tall order to ask, but people do it all the time. Uh, if you spend enough time really getting to know how mental health operates within a particular culture, you can become proficient enough such that you can help and not harm. So there would have to be considerable training and a considerable, a considerable amount of care and caution taken by the therapist as they do this sort of thing. Now, we have a history in the United States and in the Western world, the white Western world, of not doing that, of just saying, we have a wonderful model and we're just going to trounce on over to another culture and just apply it to this other group of people. And lo and behold, things aren't working out so well. And we've been doing this for literally centuries. So might this be happening in this instance? Has it happened? Absolutely. But again, when you balance it out with, okay, what's the alternative to wait 50 years to develop enough clinicians in Vietnam and no one gets any help? Well, then what are we talking about? So for sure, that's going to be an issue. Now, you bring up a book that I've never heard of that says, you know, in the title, it says The Globalization of the American Psyche. And what I'm guessing that they're talking about is that, uh, as I've talked about, as you referred to, our understanding, my understanding of the psyche is within my culture. It's not the understanding of the psyche. It's not uh, an objective understanding of psychology and personality. 
it is embedded within my culture and within the various aspects of my culture. There might be someone who lives next door to me who comes from a different background, even though they come from my community, but they have a different overall culture. And my point of view is particular to me. So if a bunch of Westerners go to Vietnam imposing their idea of not only treatment and culture, but also the the fundamental idea of what is personality, what is mental health, what is psychopathology, what is the psyche, then there could be problems for sure. And it has to be done, like I said, with extreme caution. All right, this next email is from patron Amber. She writes, do you have any advice to work on the undisciplined child schema? I am in schema therapy. However, this one is mostly glazed over and the therapist didn't have much info for me. End of email. Well, the first thing I'll say is, you know, keep pressing your therapist. If they understand schema therapy, then they're going to understand what you're talking about. And they definitely need to know that you find it to be mostly glazed over. But this is a schema that is rarely talked about or rarely discussed because I don't know why. I guess because it doesn't show up in therapy very often, maybe. Anyway, and I'm not even sure if I'm understanding what you're saying by undisciplined child schema. I'm assuming you're talking about uh, people who don't have a lot of self-control because they were raised in a way that didn't have a lot of discipline. They were essentially neglected as children regarding discipline and boundaries and helping people to control their behavior. When a child is seven years old and they want to eat cookies all day, it's important that a parent is there to help the child regulate that impulse. When a 10-year-old wants to not go to school, it's important that a parent is there in a loving, attuned way, help the child understand that they're going to go to school and that you understand that it's not a good time and that school can be stressful and let's talk about it, but you're definitely going to go to school. And I understand your impulse and there are times when I don't want to go to work, but I know that it's important that I follow my my goals in life, my my broader goals in life rather than looking at things right in front of my nose. And so if you are neglected in that way, then as an adult, often it will be this assumption that one does not have self-control or this assumption that self-control isn't very important or this general way of looking at the world and distorting rules into being too much pressure on you or just below you or something. There's there's a variety of different ways that adults will deal with their, shall we say, their, their schema, their maladaptive schema, or their complex regarding self-control and rules. And what you'll see is two things will happen. Either people will avoid anything having to do with responsibility or self-control, like they might avoid working, they might avoid having to, I don't know, regulate their food intake or uh, going, uh, you know, working out or going to school, for example. So they might avoid, even though they kind of want to do these things, they might avoid it because it's, they know from experience that they really, really struggle with internal self-control of behavior. Or they'll swing to the other end of the spectrum and overcompensate by becoming extremely controlled and extremely self-disciplined to the point where many of their other needs are neglected because they're they're just dedicating a lot of brain power to overcome their inner sense of lack of self-control. And they might judge other people for not having self-control. So a person like this might work out all the time and be very good with their diet and shame other people, that kind of thing. Uh, that's just one tiny example, but hope you get my point. So I don't know, Amber, if you're talking about that schema, but if it is that, again, talk to your therapist about it. But the general path is corrective experience around having a therapist or anybody who does what your parents should have done, which is to help you develop your superego, which is, uh, you know, oftentimes the, the way that we frame this is like, well, you have to learn to be self-disciplined. Well, 
you know, that's part of it. But another part of it is through a relationship with a caring, attuned, loving caregiver when we're young, we learn to connect good things with discipline, good things with rules. When you're being raised by a loving parent and they say, no, you can only have one cookie, but I'm really sorry, I understand that you want another cookie, then you internalize and you develop your super ego in the context of love and regulation and non-anger and non-punishment. And you learn to love yourself through self-control. And as an adult, you say, I'm going to work out because I love myself. I know that working out is painful. I know it's annoying. I know it's time consuming. But I love myself. And so I'm going to do this for myself. This is a simplistic way of looking at it. But essentially, this is the pathway to the corrective experience where it. a lot of times what people will do when they have the schema is they they either they flip flop between a, a state of complete lack of self control because it's just too hard, or they just see self control as like uh, some. Sometimes people with this schema will see rules as like uh, being too much. I don't know, too uptight. They'll they'll just be like, ah, oh, you know, rules aren't for me, and I just want to be free of anything. And what ends up happening is their life is in shambles because they they have no self-control. Now, someone can have a wonderful life and still not like to be tied down with rules. Uh, those are two different kinds of people. What we're talking about are people with a maladaptive schema around self-control uh, that leads to global personality problems regarding self-control in all aspects, whether it's things like brushing your teeth or things like giving someone a birthday card on, you know, reciprocating someone. Someone gives you a birthday card and you reciprocate or showing up on time to take someone to the airport, these sorts of things. Because someone can have such a weird complex due to their childhood around self-control or rules that they internally want to rebel against them and will try to sabotage the whole process because they they're essentially acting like a like a terrible two if you if you know what i mean or they'll swing to the other side like i said and be extremely disciplined and very judgmental of others and so there there's no middle ground and the corrective experience is around having like if i had a client like this and i have then as i i, I will it it's kind of a weird process cuz i it's a dance between me uh, suggesting things to someone while keeping them in the driver's seat, it's kind of a, it's a weird position to be in. And so, for example, let's say I have like a 22 year old who is having, who has the schema of discipline and self-control. Then I, I, I will be sucked into the counter transference and the, uh, to collude with their projective identification by judging them and coming down hard on them and saying, you need to do this and you need to do that, essentially becoming the a-hole that they believe the rule maker is or neglecting or something. You know, I might also be socialized to reject them some way. But I want to work against that and be caring and in contact with them and be attuned to them while also throwing some stuff out there. Like if they're having a hard time keeping a job or something, you know, I don't know. I might say, well, you know, what, how do you feel about the job? Well, I don't know. I, j I just feel like it's stupid. Okay. Well, what do you want to do with the job? Do you want to quit? Do you want to look for another job? How do you feel about that? What do you, you know, and the person says, yeah, I want to quit. Okay. How do you feel about quitting and not having a job? What, what kind of consequences do you think you'll have? And I'm sort of implying that you, you know, you want to think about the self-control here. I know you want to quit now, but you have to think of the bigger picture that you're not going to be able to pay your bills if you just quit today. But at the same time, I'm not coming down hard on them. I'm being caring, but I'm also throwing stuff out there like, hey, I don't want you to be uh, homeless and I want you to 
succeed in life. And so, yeah, I don't know, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a little invested as your therapist in your well-being, and I'm kind of pulling for your developing superego here of self-control and evaluating the best choice given the bigger picture here, you know. And through that corrective experience, then the person learns that self-discipline is possible, that they matter enough for someone to pay attention to that. They internalize that into their psyche, and they have a non-busted up conceptualization of discipline and of self-control. It's a, you know, that's a pretty simplistic way of explaining it, but... I think that's what I'm going to do. Let's move on to another email. But first, let's take a break. All right, we're back from the break. If you haven't become a patron of the podcast yet, please do so now. Go to patreon.com. Become a patron of the podcast. And for all of you patrons out there, thank you so, so much. Anonymous patron writes in, Recently, I listened to your rerun on passive-aggressive personality disorder that is only available, available to patrons. Listening to your experience about the nice lady got me chills. My mother-in-law makes me feel exactly the same as the woman you described as having passive-aggressive personality disorder. For the general public, she is the sweetest Christian lady, and she treats me very nicely and compliments me so hard that strangely, I feel sick to my stomach. Behind my back, though, she makes it clear that I am to blame for all my family problems. But still, in the official communication, everything is super nice, and even when I tried to talk to her openly, she defied everything that happened. I feel like a completely insane person that just fantasized about all this or is purposely starting conflict when there is no reason for it. Due to this, I cut off contact with her. It helped my mental health. However, she is still the mother of my husband. How would you approach the situation if the lady from your story was part of your family? End of email. Yeah, so in brief, passive aggressive personality disorder is characterized by early childhood trauma that was characterized by abuse that resulted in the child not being able to express their anger. So you have a child who is being mistreated and they're experiencing, experiencing a lot of hurt and fear, and they have a lot of anger as a result of that. And whenever they express any inkling of anger, they are punished even further. And so the child learns to never openly express or directly express anger, but they have a lot to be angry about. And so the anger has to come out somewhere, and so it comes out in a hidden or passive way. And these individuals will feel very put upon by others. They uh, will be, they'll have exaggerated reactions to other people. They have an exaggerated sense of threat from people around them. They will have an exaggerated sense of danger around them because of their schemas. When they were young, this is what their life was like. And so they, it just became a habitual way of neurologically uh, you know, interpreting input from the outside world, that even though there might be a calm, it's just calm before the storm. And even though people aren't, o aren't overtly uh, criticizing or abusing you, they want to abuse you and they're, they're going to abuse you. You know, that, that's the, in a nutshell, that's what it's like to have the traumas that result in what we call passive aggressive personality disorder. And listen to my whole deep dive on it. I talked about it for a long time, but but in this episode, I talked about uh, a person from my personal life who uh, had pers who I diagnosed with passive aggressive personality disorder. And some people might ask, "How do you diagnose someone in your life?" Well, when you're an expert on a particular condition and you spend enough time with someone, you could take a guess and say, mm, "You know, I bet you anything. If I had more time to assess them, that I would conceptualize them this way." And there was someone from my distant past from decades ago who I definitely refer to in my mind when I'm thinking about a quint or a particular type of passive aggressive personality in that when I was around her, she was extremely complimentary and yet terrified me. And I never knew why that was, even though I was getting just like tons and tons of compliments just all the time. 
And yet I, I had this feeling in my stomach like something was very, very wrong and that there was a lot of threat there. Now, that alone doesn't you know, uh, justify a diagnosis for sure or, a, or a, you know, a guess as to what's going on there. But from that, I began to, and you know, after years of, of interacting, uh, developed other kinds of signs and symptoms that were in addition to that. But that was a very common feeling. And so this anonymous patron is saying that her mother-in-law is very, 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 very nice, very complimentary, but then behind her back is very mean. And then she goes to her and says, hey, I heard you were saying bad things about me. Do you want to talk about it? And then she completely denies it. So I don't know if this person has passive aggressive personality disorder, but if they did, the basis of it is that, again, because of mistreatment growing up, they will see they're, – they're very quick to see threats and they're very quick to see enemies because when they were young, there were a lot of threats and a lot of enemies. So a daughter-in-law could be interpreted as a threat and an enemy. And the way that they – so when they were a child, when they were four years old – the way they dealt with the enemy was to be extremely placating and very, very nice and very, very complimentary. They might have had an extremely abusive parent or at least partially abusive parent who thrived on compliments. So the way – so one, the passive-aggressive person assumes that other people are much bigger of a threat than they actually are because of their schema – then they compensate by trying to get that person to like them by constantly complimenting them. Uh, it's this desperation of, I see a threat, I'm going to compliment them up and down because I've, I feel like that's the road to safety. But when you compliment someone up and down, the recipient of those compliments is going to detect that some of it isn't right because a lot of the compliments, if not all of them, are actually insincere. They're, it's a fakery that the person is doing. Meanwhile, the person with passive aggressive personality disorder is deeply, deeply angry at you because you are making them feel bad. The passive aggressive person has the most anger of any person on the planet but they can never express it head on. They can never even acknowledge it to themselves. When you actually ask people of passive aggressive personality disorder without, you know, if they aren't very aware or they haven't gone to treatment, they will, they'll say, I, I never get angry. They'll just say, no, I don't, I don't ever get angry. In fact, I'm the least angry person on the planet. Meanwhile, subconsciously, they are the most angry person on the planet. And so that anger has to go somewhere. And so the, it, it comes out in various different ways. And when they feel threatened by someone, whether it's real or imagined, they will get back at them in a variety of different ways. It, it's sort of like, imagine we've all been in, in, in this situation. You're at work and someone is legitimately threatening you in some way. Maybe they're bullying you or they're lying about you or something. Well, you're not going to just go home and go like, yeah, dopey do, no big deal. You're going to be hurt and you're going to be angry and you're going to want to express it. And you might do it behind the person's back because you, you're afraid of that person. And so you might go to another coworker and be like, oh, you know, that person's a B word or a C word or an A hole or whatever. And that is, in a sense, passive aggression because you're angry, you're hostile at that person, but you're not doing it directly. But if the person is legitimately a threat, then it might be the best thing to do because if you, you know, are aggressive head on, then that could just escalate the situation, right? Unknown, of course, but I, we've all been there. Well, to the passive aggressive personality disordered individual, they will see threats where they don't exist. They will see a holes where there aren't a holes, <laughs> and uh, and it won't just be a slight little bit of threat. It'll be like severe threat. We're talking off the charts threat that they will feel from other people. So uh, you anonymous patron are saying that due to this, that you cut off contact with her, which, you know, is understandable if, uh, if that's the situation you're dealing with and that it has helped your mental health, because that's usually all that you can do. 
but you're still connected to her because it's the mother of your husband uh, and you still have to deal with her. So you're asking, you know, like, um, you know, how do you approach a situation if the person is in your family? I don't know. Uh, uh, one, I would try to, uh, so this is just me and I'm a specialist in this disorder and have treated it before and have studied it quite a bit. And so if I had someone like this in my family, which I don't currently, thank God, then I would, conce- one, I would conceptualize their behavior as accurately as I can. And I would try, I would try not to take it personally. It might be hard, but I try to not take it personally. Because if they're in my family, I'm going to have to see them probably. I'm going to have to deal with them. And so I would do that. The second thing is, is I'd try to get off of their radar. I would essentially try to make myself not a threat to them. I'd try to make sure that they did not think of me as a threat. And I would also try at the same time not to get very close to them. So that'd be a tight uh, you know, line to walk, right? Between make reassuring that person to make sure that they don't think of you as a threat, but also staying distant enough such that they they don't hurt you and you don't get wrapped up in their issues. Yeah, that's, you know, it's a tough situation to be in. Having said that, if you have an abusive person in your family, uh, you can draw boundaries even if it's your mother-in-law. All right, this next email is from patron Lisa from Chicago. She writes, where can childhood separation anxiety disorder without death abandonment come from? I just don't understand. End of email. Right, so essentially patron Lisa is saying that there's a child with separation anxiety disorder but there hasn't been any death that is in the family or abandonment to the child. So you have a child that has not experienced death or abandonment. How can that child have separation anxiety? Well, there's a lot of paths that are a lot less uh, obvious than death of a parent or abandonment. Uh, There's emotional neglect, emotional abandonment that can, that can happen from a variety of different uh, avenues. If the parent is overwhelmed, depressed, going through a divorce, uh, working too much, if the parent was raised in an emotionally neglectful way themselves, then that can cause problems. If the parent has uh, uh, medical issues, basically anything that causes a child to feel emotionally alone, alone with, without anyone there to help them, And that can happen through a variety of different ways. A child could be traumatized. They could be bullied at school, and that can cause separation anxiety. There's there's a lot of different avenues to separation anxiety. And most of the people, most of the kids that I treated with it did not have an obvious reason as to why they had it. So, you know, uh, it... It's important to get treatment for the child and, and the family. The main thing, if a child had separation anxiety, the, the first recommendation I have is for family therapy. And go to a family therapist that understands how to help parents. Because to what a lot of people will do is they'll just treat the child with separation anxiety, which I would find nearly impossible to do without working with the parents. So... That's what I recommend. And some people out there might be saying, well, uh, my child has separation anxiety, but I'm a good parent. I'm very loving. I don't abuse the child. And I've been great. Well, there's a lot of other things that could be happening. One, if there's divorce, that can cause separation anxiety. If there's an older sibling that they really bonded with and something happened there, that can cause it. If the, if the family moves a lot and they move away from grandparents or from aunts and uncles, if there was a nanny, for example, or a daycare person they really bonded with and that person was traumatically ripped away from them, that can cause problems. Also, parenting is complicated and some kids are just more sensitive. So that can become part of the factor or another factor. Another thing is you can be a quote unquote good parent and also be slightly neglecting emotionally. And that happens frequently where you'll look at a parent or group of parents and see love and, you know, general attention, no chaos, no drug addiction, no mental issues, 
but just a, a low grade level of emotional neglect and lack of attunement. And when a child experiences that, most of their needs are being met, but some are not. And over time, that can lead to all sorts of anxiety issues, including separation anxiety. All right, next email is from anonymous patron. Uh, she writes, I was listening to your avoidant personality disorder deep dive, and I thought of a friend I have. She was checked out when, when I was in middle school, she was checked out from school often. I just assumed it had something to do with anxiety or her family. Once we got to high school, she started missing weeks of school at a time. Her mom would always come and pick up her homework for her. We ended up drifting apart. I feel like the longer we stayed apart, the more afraid she'd get of interacting with me and the more she'd avoid me. I think I might be the closest friend she has, and I still worry about her a lot. She hardly ever comes out of her house anymore. I think a huge part of it also might be due to intense anxiety. I want to be friends with her and become closer friends with her again, but I don't want to scare her away. What would be the best way possible to gain her trust again? End of email. Well, you're saying it's possible that the person has avoidant personality disorder, but based on your description, it it could be a variety of things. Uh, They might not even like you. (laughs) There's also other personality disorders and anxiety disorders, also depression, also medical problems. You know, there's just a whole bunch of reasons why you might observe what you observed there. Now, I'll take your word for it that you're observing anxiety and that you have a hunch or at least some indication that the person has avoidant personality disorder, meaning that they have a deep, deep schema that there's something wrong with them and they're actually protecting the world from them because – They know that they're awkward or weird and everyone can see it. And so they might as well just stay home. And so they avoid. And you're saying, well, what's the best way to gain their trust again? Well, uh, it really just depends on what's going on. If it is avoidant personality disorder, that's a hard one to deal with as a friend. Uh, She would need to get some pretty specialized treatment before she could even uh, begin to trust other people in the way that she would need to to interact with you. But if it was something else, you just don't know. The, the best thing I say uh, to people, I think, <laughs> when they ask questions like this, friends who want to help other people, is just tell her how you feel. Just say, hey, I miss you. I'm worried about you. I, I, I'm worried that you're going to be scared away if I say something. And that makes me sad. And I, I want to be your friend. I want to hang out like we used to. And what do we need to do here? Uh, Do you want to hang out with me? Because in all likelihood, your old friend wants to hang out with you and wants to talk with you. And maybe it's not all the time. Maybe it's not in person, particularly during lockdown. But, uh, you know, I'm guessing that there's some inroad there. And by being a good friend and by telling her how you feel, it might open the door. But I don't know. I mean, it just it's hard to say what's going on there. All right, this next email is from I don't know who, and they say, I'm intrigued about the books on the bookshelf behind you in the videos. I see a choose your own adventure book there. At least I think I do. I'm curious what kind of books a brilliant man like Dr. Honda reads. Also, I see a DSM-5. Is it expensive in America because it's $500 here in Australia? Academic books here are so overpriced. End of email. Yeah, I do in the videos have a choose your own adventure book behind me. It's not always on display, but as a child, as like a, I don't know, a third grader, I loved the choose your own adventure books that were popular at the time and wanted all of them, but they were so expensive, it was hard to get them. And there was this one, the the third planet from Altair that I loved because it was sci-fi. I, I, you know, Star Wars times. And so I loved the sci-fi stuff. And I would read it and I would go on all sorts of adventures in this book. And it was sort of a precursor to Dungeons and Dragons and I guess role-playing games in general. This idea of you could enter this world and you could make choices and there'd be consequences. And and, because to me, Dungeons and Dragons and Choose Your Own Adventure books and some video games, it's all a matter of choices. And life is a bunch of choices. Do you go on a date tonight? Do you hang out with your friends? Do you start a podcast? And there are consequences to it, but there are glory. There's glory potential in it as well. And there's also a lot of moments in life where your your morals are being tested. 
you see someone being oppressed or someone being bullied, what do you do? Do you do something and, or do you just walk away? And these sort of moments that are very frequent in a game like Dungeons and Dragons, I find to be very compelling uh, brain space to be in. <laughs> so yeah, I have a Choose Your Own Adventure book behind me. I actually had to rebuy it because I somehow lost it, you know, from third grade, but I rebought it on Amazon or something. And in terms of the books I have behind me, I have a video that should be coming out soon or already came out. Uh, Stacy has, uh, she does all the scheduling of the videos. It's probably out by now, by the time this episode comes out. And it's a video in which I go over everything on my shelf that is behind me. So you can see that there. You asked DSM-5 expensive in, in America. It's $500 in Australia. In the United States, I think it's a, it's over $100. I know that much. Maybe like 150 or something. So, yeah. I mean, on some level, I understand why it is priced a lot because it is a large book and a lot of work goes into that thing. So it kind of makes sense. Plus, it's a pretty specialized book. I, I have bought a total of two DSMs in the span of a career of 25 years. So, you know, you, you only have to buy one of the, as a clinician, you only have to buy one of those things once every, I don't know, 15 years or something. And so it's, you know, it's, it's a worthy investment. We all need one. This next email is from anonymous pilot patron. They write, I'm a pilot. And in this industry, mental health is extremely stigmatized. Pilots can lose their medical and thus their ability to fly if they see a therapist for any reason. If they have taken or ever taken an antidepressant or any type of medication for mental reasons, it takes months to years to prove you are fit to fly. As a result, I feel pilots are afraid to seek help for fear of losing their jobs. Do you have any suggestions on how to make a change in this industry? I feel this mentality has the opposite intended effect where pilots aren't getting the help that they need. End of email. Yeah, this is a huge problem. Uh, there's a lot I can say, but one of the th there's a few things I'll say is that I don't know if you remember this, but as a pilot, you probably do. There was a flight in I believe Europe where a pilot uh, intentionally drove a full plane, uh, you know, full of passengers into a mountainside and killed himself and killed all the passengers. And there was a lot of stories that came out about it, a lot of investigation, a lot of reporting. And for a lot of people, the the tag, the you know, the headline was that he was depressed and suicidal, and that's why he did it. But that's ridiculous because when you're depressed and suicidal, you don't have an, an, an you don't want to kill hundreds of innocent people. <laughs> the, uh, so many depressed people are out there, and so many people are out there thinking about suicide. Uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of them have no intention on bringing anyone down with them. Now, we do hear about people who do. And uh, strangely, uh, in other circumstances, when we have like a mass shooter or something, you'll people see them as like mentally ill, like they're a psychopath or bipolar or something. But usually the way I see them is they were suicidal and very angry at society and wanted to take people down with them. But the pilot who killed everyone uh, was the same, uh, but somehow everyone saw that person as, because uh, it's a much easier story, right? It's like, uh, and that's why I believe this exists in the airline industry around the world, is that uh, there's so much anxiety about flying in airplanes. You know, whenever there's an air, airplane crash, uh, justifiably so, there's a lot of anxiety and there's a lot of um, investigation into it, right? And the airlines will do everything they can to, at, at the very least, come across to the public like they're doing everything they can to make sure that everything is safe. And since society stigmatizes people with mental conditions or that or who go to therapy, then the airlines have to comply with that culture. I'm guessing there are people who work in these airline in you know it, that work for airlines who know the science and understand that if someone goes to therapy that is not associated with anything terrible or with an issue of safety. In fact, I'm sure a lot of people who work for the airline administration understand that encouraging people to go to therapy could be a wonderful thing. 
and that to stigmatize it actually might, as you say, cause problems because people don't get the help that they need. But if you had a, uh, a plane that crashed and it came out in the news that the pilot had gone to therapy, well, society stigmatizes that. And then the society is going to look to the airline and they're going to say, you knew that this person was going to therapy and you didn't do anything. You knew this person was depressed and you knew this person was on antidepressants. You knew this person was taking a, you know, anti-anxiety medication and you didn't do anything. You let that person fly. Well, it's because society is stupid. They don't understand. <laughs> they have a lack of information. They have a lot of weird ideas pumped in their heads. And so uh, I don't know, but I suspect that the airlines would change if society changed. So, you know, you're asking, like, do I have suggestions on how to change this in the industry? We got to change society. Because let's say, like I said, let's say we did change the industry. Well, that's not going to change the fact that society is going to freak if they find out that, or a, a section of society is going to freak out if they find out that their pilot is on antidepressants because they just don't understand what that means. So it's a terrible situation we're in and it is awful. And what it ends up doing is very likely, and I'm guessing there's studies along these lines, but I don't have it in front of me that demonstrate because of the, these policies, because of this culture of stigma, you have a bunch of people who are pilots who avoid going to therapy and their problems get worse. And guess what? Now we do have a safety problem because the person can't sleep at night or they're drinking to cope because of course, drinking is okay. Uh, you know, Learning that a pilot had a couple of drinks the night before, not a big deal, right? But maybe they're sneaking drinks on the side. Maybe they are taking Xanax on the side because their their spouse gives them Xanax or, you know, who knows what's happening. Basically, you're driving things underground and bad things are going to happen. And it's utterly ridiculous. Uh, half of Americans will qualify for a diagnosis in the DSM at some point in their life. And I would suspect that half of pilots, maybe more, because the pilot life is, you know, it's it's rough. And so, but, you know, let's just say they're average. Half of pilots will qualify for a mental disorder at some point in their life. Not a, not a mild problem, but a full-blown mental disorder. PTSD, depression, anxiety, bipolar, adjustment disorder, ADHD, you know, a variety of things, personality disorders. And uh, to somehow say that those people are unfit to fly is just ridiculous. The same thing with police officers and fire, uh, you know, what do you call it? Firemen. You can't call them firemen, right? Fire people, <laughs> firefighters, firefighters, therapists. Half of therapists suffer from a mental disorder at some point in their life. That doesn't mean they're bad therapists. So, yeah, I'm sorry that you're going through that. There's a similar problem in the Defense Department in the United States. I don't know if it's still a problem, but if you are even just a contractor who, you know, engineers planes that are to be used in war for the United States, uh, there's a ton of stigma and maybe even losing your job and your security clearance if you're in therapy for any reason. That's the whole other thing. Like, let's say you go to therapy because you just want to figure out what career you should be, or you're trying to improve your relationship with your spouse. How in the world is that a safety issue as a pilot? <laughs> just like complete, utter ignorance is just ridiculous. I mean, it is 2021, people. Grow up. Okay, deep breath. Next email. Anonymous patron writes, how can one explain to their significant other that when they are trying to quote unquote express their feelings, that they are actually attacking and criticizing me. The other day, my fiance said she feels that I was quote unquote playing stupid during a conversation and it triggered me. So I walked away instead of responding. She followed me and yelled that she can never express her feelings. If I would have said that's not a feeling, she would have been triggered worse. I don't know how to explain this to her without an argument. End of email. Yeah, this is a very common thing. It's very, very common when a, you know, in a relationship, let's just say a spousal relationship, and you're in an argument, it's very, very common for one person 
to say, but I'm expressing my feelings or how come you won't let me express my feelings? Even though the person isn't really expressing their primary feelings anyway. And certainly if someone says, look, I feel that you're playing stupid. Uh, that's not a, f like you say, it's not a feeling. So, you know, how do you work this out? Well, you go to a couples therapist because this is a, this is a minefield for people. Uh, you're talking about some very fundamental paradigm shifts that at least she has to change and possibly you. And for you to just say, okay, I'm going to help. And I'm going to try to change this. That's tall order. But if I was to give some advice, you know, here's what I would say is that try not to argue is the point. So your fiance is like, uh, you know, hey, look, I feel like you're playing stupid, in, you know, in that previous conversation. All right. So you're hurt and you say it triggered you. Okay. So just stick to your feelings and say, okay. So there's two parallel things that you can do at the same time. And you try to do it as best you can. It's hard without a couple's therapist there, but you try to do it at the same time. You try to say, okay, uh, on what are they trying to tell me? They're saying, they're saying something mean, which is you're playing stupid. Okay. What are they, what are they trying to get across to me or what's behind that statement? You know, it might be something like, uh, okay, so I hear you saying that I'm playing stupid. What I'm, what I'm thinking is that you felt like I wasn't really listening to you or you felt like I was acting like I didn't know what you're talking about. Um, so I hear you on that. And when you said that to me, it hurt my feelings because I feel like I was really trying. Okay, so that's the parallel process there is that on one hand, you're trying to find what they're saying and validating it, or at least trying to understand what they're saying and at least reflect that you hear them. Because if you don't do that, then things usually escalate. At the same time, or right after that, you express the way you said that it hurt my feelings. So getting into an argument about, you know, you're not expressing your feelings, you're just criticizing me, that's usually not going to help. So if you want to, one, de-escalate the conflict, it's all a matter of validating and then expressing your feelings in a way that doesn't hurt the other person. So you could say something like, so honey, I love you. You know, you reach out, hold her hand and you say, uh, sometimes uh, when you say things or my feelings, like when you said that you felt like I was playing stupid, it felt like, it felt like an, a, an accusation that wasn't really true because I feel like I'm trying. Uh, I'm guessing I did something to make you feel that way and I'm sorry, but I feel like you it, you're just assuming that I, I'm like trying to get you or something. And, and it's just not really the case. So you, you hear me when I say that it, it, it could be interpreted as an attack. And, you know, certainly those things that particularly if someone has escalated, but if you're both relatively calm, it gives the other person an opportunity to be like, Oh, okay. The person cares. The person's trying, the person's telling me some feedback here, but they're not being too aggressive and they're not, shutting me down and they understand me, you know, so, you know, that's just the general, but again, go to a couple's therapist. That's why we exist. All right. This next email is from anonymous patron. They write, I have a friend who made a big mistake. This mistake damaged my relationship with him. I've been struggling with whether or not I should support him and where the line is between accountability and forgiveness. I come from an enmeshed family where mistakes are swept under the rug, so I don't really know what accountability looks like in practice. I wonder if you have insights to share about growth after existentially threatening mistake or about accountability and friendships. End of email. Right. So anonymous patron is uh, not being very specific, but it sounds like the friend made a big mistake, maybe at work, and that uh, the anonymous patron is like, well, I want to support my friend as they go through this process. But at the same time, uh, I feel like they need to be held accountable and that they need to ask for forgiveness from me. And then I come from an enmeshed families where, you know, mistakes were swept under the rug. So I don't know what this looks like. Well, so it, 
it, I'm glad, Anonymous Patron, that you're thinking about this and that you recognize that your upbringing might influence things, and you might be you might have a bit of a complex around quote unquote accountability. I wouldn't focus so much. I don't know what the problem is. I'd have to know what happened there. But usually when people are talking about accountability, what they're talking about is their feelings are hurt or they're scared or something. And instead of talking about you need to be held accountable, just stick to your feelings. How do you feel? Do you feel hurt? Do you feel scared? What's going? What, what's the quality of that fear? What's the quality of that hurt? Why did they hurt you? How much did they hurt you? And express that. And then you have absolutely every right to say, I deserve an apology for how you made me feel. At the same time, friend of mine, I want to support you as you go through this mistake and I want to be there for you. And at the same time, I'm hurt and I feel like in order for me to build trust back with you, I need you to apologize or I need you to see, I need you to understand what you did to me. All right, this next email is from Anonymous Patron. They write, My boyfriend cheated on me when we started dating, but we made up, and I, but I bring it up sometimes, which makes him feel awful about himself, and he frankly asked me to stop because, quote, we already had this conversation. I already apologized many times, unquote. Is there any way to resolve this in your opinion? End of email. Yeah, I've talked about this before, but I suppose it bears repeating that... You need to go to a therapist to recover from this, a couples therapist who specializes in uh, infidelity recovery. And two, that it's universal that when a, the cheater apologize or the, when the uh, cheater uh, you know apologizes, that they believe they only need to apologize a certain amount of times, and it's always a hundred times more than that. The cheater will either think, "I only need to apologize once." No, <laughs> cheaters need to apologize as many times as necessary such that the cheated on partner will feel like they can trust or it, it'll it just happen throughout one's life. I mean, it's not uncommon for some uh, for a couple to be together for 50 years and for an upwelling of pain to emerge in the cheated on partner and they deserve to say, I'm feeling that pain from 50 years ago of you cheating on me and it really hurts and I feel it right now. I need you to apologize again, not as a way of punishing the cheating partner, but as a way of rebuilding trust, as a way of saying, hey, you hurt me and I'm having waves of hurt. It's sort of like if, uh, as a metaphor, I suppose, if I, what would be, what would be a metaphor? If I threw a boomerang that had a magical boomerang and it was, it, it has like a homing beacon for your head <laughs> and every so often kind of randomly, it just comes out of the blue and smacks you in the head. But, and I did it on purpose. You know, I threw that boom, that magical boomerang knowing it was going to hit your head and, and, but I didn't know it was going to hit your head all the time. I didn't read the instructions well enough. And it turns out that the magic boomerang for the rest of someone's life is going to hit that person. And I only thought it was going to hurt. I only thought it was going to hit the person in the head once, but it turns out it hits the person in the head 500,000 times. Well, then I need to apologize every single time that boomerang hits you in the head, right? Now I can say I had no idea it was going to hit you in the head 500. I only thought it was going to hit you in the head once, but clearly this thing is going to hit you in the head 500,000 times. I'm so sorry every single time. Well, that's what cheating is like. When someone cheats, they're like, it's all, research finds this, that the cheating partner is just like, I had no idea how much pain this was going to cause my partner. If I knew how much pain it was going to cause them, I never would have taken this risk. And it's just one of those things that it's just not taught in schools. We teach, you know, geometry and trigonometry and, you know, how to conjugate a verb, but we don't teach this, this fundamental thing about life. And no one knows about it. No, ad, no adult knows about it. And we need to be teaching people about this, about the consequences of human interactions and relationships and marriages. Anyway, so part of what couples therapy does when it is with a specialist in infidelity recovery is they explain this to the cheater. I've had these conversations with the cheaters. And I'll say, you know, they'll say, I don't understand why we have to have this conversation so many times. It's really hurtful to me. 
I've apologized so many times. I turn to the cheater and I go, I get it. I hear you. Everyone, all cheaters are like that. But here's the reality. What you did to your spouse is going to have reverberations for the rest of their life, particularly while you're together. And every time that feeling emerges within your spouse, your spouse has two choices. One, to be quiet and resent you. Or two, tell you what's going on for them and give you an opportunity to make up for it. Which would you like your partner to do? Would you like them to suppress their feeling and resent you and hate you? Or would you like them to be vulnerable to you and give you a chance to make up for it? Your choice. Because the feeling is going to emerge as many times as it's going to emerge within the cheated on partner. The cheated on partner has no control over those reverberations. They're just going to happen. So which would you like your partner to do? (laughs) Because uh, we all know the answer to that question. And so a big part of it is me uh, you know, educating, so to speak, the cheating partner on reality, on what is going to happen here, on the reality of what it's like to be cheated on. And maybe it's five more times that you have to apologize. Maybe it's 5,000 times, but it's going to happen as many times as it needs to happen. So I don't know, anonymous patron, how you have that conversation with your partner uh, without pissing them off. I suppose you could have them listen to this little section right here. (laughs) But again, get to therapy with a specialist. All right. Well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself. And don't cheat on others because we all deserve it. We really, really do. (laughs) 